What I'm going to do is to, uh, I'm going to speak for a while, then Robin's going to speak, and then uh, I'll finish up. So this, some of you heard us speak before, and you might be saying to yourself, not those two again. <laughs> we've heard it all, but we've got a different presentation, you'll be happy to know. And so there will be an exam on this material uh, at the end of the session. Okay. One key concept that we've not emphasized in previous presentations has been the uh, importance of the prefrontal cortex. And we heard a little about uh, introduction about it a second ago, but we want to focus on this and its importance in education. So two questions, what is the prefrontal cortex and why does it matter? If you think about the word prefrontal, what would that mean? It would mean in front of front, which would mean it's out here somewhere. It's a really dumb term, uh, but it's not exactly there. All mammals um, have a region in the front of the brain, so up here, uh, that acts to uh, support cognitive functions necessary to coordinate behavior in time. An example of this in humans would be autobiographical memory. We have a memory of what happened when we were in grade three and what hap happened when we were um, in our early 20s, and we have some concept of what will happen in the future. This is the prefrontal cortex. The kinds of functions that are in there are on your slide, things like imagination, social interaction, and so on. And I see that the slides here change, but the Don't slides lag. there didn't. Don't Not my problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. oh. where, where am I aiming this at? Oh, back there. Back over there, okay. Yeah. <laughs> now you can see what it says. Um, and these, these uh, functions are often called executive functions. And Robin will talk some, somewhat about the importance of training children, both in kindergarten and later, in executive functions. This is an interesting problem because they don't change together. Okay, take note. Yeah. <laughs> they don't change together. So the prefrontal cortex is this, oh, and the, is there a pointer on here? Yes. Uh, but where would I point? Not going to work. Okay. If you look at the colored area at the front, you can see um, zones that have numbers on them. Uh, the brain doesn't come that way, but uh, anatomists have put them on there. And the stuff that's the prefrontal cortex really has two parts. It has a part up here, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and stuff behind your eyes, which is the orbital prefrontal cortex. And if you take that out, it's called a lobotomy. So what we're interested in is the development of this stuff. So the answers are um, prefrontal cortex is found in all mammals, as I said, but it's very late to develop. This is important because it means that it's influenced by developmental experiences that actually begin in utero and are still going on. We used to think that the prefrontal cortex uh, if you look at books that are probably sort of really old books like 1995, uh, we're going to say um, maybe age 20. We now know that um, prefrontal development continues well into the 30s, but the, there are two peak times, however. One is in early childhood and one is during puberty. The effect of this long developmental period is that virtually every serious mental health issue that, that people have involves some dysfunction of the prefrontal region of the brain. So let's look at brain development. This is an amazing thing, the brain that we have. It's got at least 80 billion brain cells, neurons, and each of those has about 15,000 connections, so something in the order of 10 to the 14th connections. You could not have a blueprint of such an amazing um, piece of work. You could have a blueprint in principle of a kidney or of a heart. They're fairly simple in structure, but the brain is not. So what you have to do is you have to have a different strategy. And the strategy that Mother Nature designed is, let's start with this big hunk of tissue and get rid of half of it. And what we're going to do is we're going to have the brain so it adapts to whatever environment you're in. So if you're living in a Nuvik, what's going to be needed in that brain is different than what's going to be needed in Manhattan. And in fact, the brains are quite different if people are raised in those kinds of uh, different uh, locations. So if you look at the stages of brain development, 
You have to think about brain development. Each cell is being an individual. So the cells are born. We have a nursery in the brain. You still have it, I hope. If you don't, you've got a problem. So we've got this nursery. Cells are born. Then they have to leave home, and they have to migrate to where they're going to be when they grow up. In contrast to our kids who stay around, uh, these ones leave. Then the cells differentiate into something. They uh, mature. They grow connections. Um, and then we start getting rid of them. And it's getting rid of them that turns out to be really important for uh, early childhood education. So if we look at this uh, nice uh, image here, you can see the cross sections through the fetal brain. You can see in that uh, panel second from the left, the nursery, which is around the ventricles, the, the tubes of water in your brain. The cells are going to migrate from that nursery on little roads, and they're going to end up where they're supposed to be. Now, they must go to the right region, and they must go to the right layer in the, in the brain. You can see here cells that at birth are quite simple, and as you look from left to right, the cells are getting uh, more and more complicated. And they're sculpted actively, and it says here for 20 plus years, and it's way more than 20 years. If I asked each one of you to think back and, and say to yourself, when was it that I became who I am? There's going to be a sex difference. Men are going to be a little later. But I think that for most people, it's going to be after age 25 that they can say, I haven't changed a whole lot since then. Certainly, I'm nothing like I was when I was 20. And I knew her and she was 20, and neither is she. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say if it's good or bad, it's just a thing. Um, and I think I probably haven't changed much since um, I turned 30 and she knew me then and she can tell you whether or not that's the case. The point is it's a long, prolonged period. Now if we look here, um, what you can see, it says striate visual cortex and prefrontal cortex. There's two lines. So if you look at the, the far left, it says conception. And we're looking at the number of connections in, in the different regions of the brain. If we go towards birth, you can see they're both climbing. So connections are being formed prenatally. We're climbing. And for the uh, visual cortex, the peak is around one year. So now you have the most connections you're ever going to have in that region of the brain. For the prefrontal cortex, this, this drawing, it turns out, is a bit out of date. Um, it looks like it's about age two, but in fact, a study that um, we read just this week that uh, just came out suggests that in the prefrontal cortex, the peak may not be until at least age five or six, so it's actually quite late, which means when kids are in kindergarten, they're still uh, developing cells and connections in the prefrontal cortex. Then there's a period of where nothing seems to happen, and then you start getting rid of them. So if you just look at the prefrontal cortex, you start losing connections just before puberty. So in girls, let's say around age 10, boys probably a year later, around age 11. And at the peak of, of synaptic loss, children are losing 100,000 connections per second. That's a lot of connections. So 100,000 gone, 100,000 gone, 100,000 gone. And if you think of 14-year-old girls, you can't wait for them to lose a lot. Um, <laughs> to turn into people you'd want to be around. And so what happens is during this puberty time and going into late teens, there's a huge drop, but it continues right into the 30s. So it's this prolonged effect. So what's happening is these uh, connections that are being formed early on that you can see in early childhood and then uh, deleted beginning in late juvenile and into uh, pubescence, these uh, connections are being um, formed and changed by what I'm going to call chisels. Those chisels are experiences that you have in your life. So whether they're hormones, uh, gonadal hormones, stress hormones, um, or teacher-parent interactions, sorry, te yeah, that too, teacher-child interactions, <laughs> parent-child interactions, peer-peer interactions, and whatnot. Exposure to all kinds of stuff, as you'll see. Now, if you take kids and you throw them in an MRI, and you bribe them to be still, the earliest you can do this is around age five. Earlier than that, you can take a three-year-old and say, don't move and we'll be good to you, you're right. They've got to sit still for about half an hour. So that's not going to happen. But you can see the, I hope you can see the colors, and you can see the colors go from um, yellow and red to blue. The bluer the color, the thinner the cerebral cortex is. So if you look at the pictures on the, on the uh, left, you can see that it's very uh, red and, and uh, yellow and, and green. And as you go towards age 20, it's getting bluer and bluer. And note that the pattern of blueness goes from back to front. So it's the front that's the latest in, um, 
It's the front that's the latest in, in developing, and th uh, this picture shows age 20, and probably in terms of cortical thickness, that's about uh, as far as you would go. Now, people are gonna say, you're saying that less brain is better, and the answer is, yeah, it is. And so if we, if we look here, uh, the little dots reflect regions of the left hemisphere that are co inversely correlated with vocabulary skills. So that means the thinner that cortex is, the better your vocabulary will be. It's counterintuitive. So you can see there is a whole wide range of regions in which we see decreasing cortical thickness and increasing vocabulary. What happens if that doesn't happen? Well, your vocabulary is no good. So what we have, not, that's, sorry, that's a wrong term. Your vocabulary is less good um, than those who have thinner cortex. So we've got this strange, strange event happening here. All right, so what are some of the factors that are going, going to influence prefrontal development? Well, there's a whole bunch of factors. And I'm not going to go into any detail on, on most of these, but you'll get a flavor from them. So there's five different types of factors that we can identify uh, easily. There are others as well. You can see what they are, sensory motor experience. I'll explain that in a second. Early stress, psychoactive drugs. And by psychoactive drugs, I'm including prescription drugs that mom might have taken or non-prescription drugs that mom might have taken or in both cases, dad might have taken before conception. Um, and we can look also at the drugs that, that we encounter postnatally in the, the whole range, obviously. Parent-infant relationships and peer relationships. So if we, one example that we can look at in terms of sensory motor experience is tactile stimulation. This is a powerful event, and here's some examples of tactile stimulation in our world, in the kangaroo world, and in the laboratory rat world. So we can see in the bottom um, left, we've got a little brush, and we're going to tactilely stimulate this baby rat for 15 minutes three times a day. This, the idea of these experiments came from the fact that these kinds of treatments are used in, in premature infants in hospitals, and they actually grow faster and release from hospitals sooner. And it turns out that just doing this to these little rats, we originally did this with a little brush. Now uh, we use a Swifter, because you can do a whole bunch at once. You can line them all up and just <laughs> go along. And when I say we, I don't mean me. Um, I mean undergraduates like to do this. So it's, here, sign up, pet rats. So, so if you do this and then you wait till they grow up, don't do anything else to them, wait till they grow up, what you find is that they have superior cognitive skills, they have superior motor skills. And if you look at the structure of their brain, one of the biggest changes is in the structure of cells in the prefrontal cortex. We see modifications of the neural networks in prefrontal cortex in response to this tactile stimulation. It's a powerful stimulation. So then we think about it and you say, well, that's interesting in rats. What does it happen in people? Well, there's two examples there. There's the maternal massage, which is prenatal, and then we have the um, kangaroo care with the dad holding the infant postnatal. So the Skin-to-skin -skin uh, contact, uh, it turns out to be really important. The tactile um, contact is, is truly important. We've done lots of research trying to figure out why this happens, and we can give you molecular explanations, but they don't matter right now. All that matters is this is important. Second one is early stress. It's an example of the opposite kind of effect. Early stressors in, in uh, humans might be the mum's um, got all kinds of worries. I mean, after all, she's having a baby. Uh, the dad's got worries. They don't have enough money. Maybe there's arguments, all kinds of things. Somebody loses a job, and so on and so on. So if we look at the effect of early stress on brain development, it turns out that even if it's fairly mild stress, we have profound experience, uh, experiences that can actually be seen in middle age, in adulthood. So what happens? Well, we have smaller brains. We have larger adrenal glands, because the adrenal glands are responding to the stress, obviously. And we see the biggest changes are in frontal lobe development. And you can see on those two um, photographs on the bottom, two different regions. And so in the rat, we're, we're looking at those two prefrontal regions, the one up here and the one behind the eyes. And you can see in each of those little uh, panels that the picture on the right is simpler that is, there are fewer little stubby things on, the, on that uh, cell than the one on the left. Those represent synaptic zones, so places of contact. And so what you've seen here, or you can see here, is a decrease of about 25 to 40% in the number of connections. Now this is in an adult animal whose mom was stressed, and then the stress stopped. And then the, the infants were born, we let them grow up and we look in their brain. It's a huge effect on prefrontal development. 
One of the effects of this is they don't play normally and they have abnormal cognitive and, and, and uh, motor behaviors, exactly the opposite of the tactile stimulation. So one of the treatments obviously for early stress might be tactile stimulation of the mums. So as Brian mentioned, um, our early life can set the stage for how stress can affect our brains. And that early life actually extends from research we've recently done into the prenatal period. And I've just completed some studies with Brian and a uh, postdoc in our lab, Rochelle Machasek. And what we've discovered is that it even extends into the preconception period. So things that happen before you conceive your child can actually affect their brain development. And that seems to be particularly true for things like stress. So when you have kids coming into the classroom, grade one, it's important to understand that they come with a background of how their brains have been developed and in part how they have been tuned in to stress processes as a result of the experiences that they've had. So a, they can be classified by both their behavioral and physiological responses. Some kids are very reactive in classroom environments, other kids are not. So you, you all, any of you who've had these classroom experiences with little kids understand that some kids uh, are very quiet and don't interact a great deal. Other kids are highly reactive and have lots to say and, and really uh, sort of uh, have no fears about the things that are going on in the classroom. And it turns out that those two styles require different kinds of teaching in order to optimize their development. So, and, and there's good evidence to show that how the teacher interacts with kids in grade one, independent of how, of how these children are parented, have effects on how well they do in grade seven, both in mental health and as far as their academic performances go. So children who don't have high stress reactivity and have a relationship with their teacher are actually more tuned into absence of conflict. What they don't want to have is a conflict with the teacher. Because if they have conflict, they tend to do worse as they get into grade seven. Those kids that are highly reactive work better with strong relationship with the teacher. They want teacher closeness. And if there's an absence of teacher closeness in these children, that's what predicts um, more failure in grade seven as far as their mental health processes go. So you're, you're not always dealing with the same thing when you have kids coming in and stress actually changes the way we react to our environment and keeping that in mind, that should change your teaching strategies for these kids. So uh, a classroom that's very stable is, is much better for a child who, who is non-reactive, who likes uh, consistency, who is uh, more timid or shy. Yet a chaotic classroom can work very well for children who are reactive because they get in there and actually participate at all levels of the planned activities. So uh, success in school actually requires that your executive function, those functions that are uh, uh, component of how the prefrontal cortex actually makes a difference in our lives. Those are all fundamental as far as uh, having success in school and I've listed four and they're slightly different than the ones Brian gave you examples of. Creativity, flexibility, self-control and discipline. And these qualities are actually, if you check uh, or do test these qualities in kids, kids that have better developed executive function have better school readiness, and this is a better predictor of their school readiness than their IQ. So it is important to understand that we need to develop executive function so that uh, children will actually uh, come forward and, and be able to do better in school as a result of that development. Okay. So <clears throat> if we look at children between the ages of three and seven. Do I still move this here? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, okay. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, we're on uh, self-control. It's back farther. Back. Yeah. Yeah, just one. There we go. There we are. Okay. okay? I just have to quickly get your power. Sorry about that. That's okay. I just don't want to fall off this little thing. <laughs> Okay, 
So children who have worse self-control when they're tested at, even as early as age three tend to have more problems with stress, they are more lonely, and they're less physically fit than kids who have better self-control. They have worse health outcomes. They earn less as adults, and they commit more crimes 30 years later after they've been tested. So clearly there is some real advantage in making sure that kids have good executive function. And if that was the goal of our education system, then we would actually see uh, all kinds of benefits as a nation. It, it has been shown by, um, by economists, and one is just recently published by Moffat et al. in uh, Proceeding of National Academy of Science in 2011, that even very small improvements in executive function, function in kids can translate to later health improvements, wealth improvements, and lower crime for a nation. So how do we improve executive function? There is a lovely review that Adele Diamond has just done on executive function and schooling, and she has listed all sorts of activities that have been shown to improve executive function. One of the activities that came up is computerized training, or a hybrid computer and non-computer games, and an example of that is a game called Cog Ed. Now, there's a few of these different kinds of games, and many of them are designed to, uh, with algorithms, work at the level that the child is working at and if they need remediation in some areas it changes the program on the fly to work on those areas so it's really quite exciting and uh, there are it, the problem with this is it works better in older children than younger children. So this works really well for children about ages 8 to 11. But if we're talking about children in kindergarten, pre-kindergarten, or in those very early years in school, they tend not to be as optimal for these children's development. Something that I think is very exciting is it has now been shown that aerobic exercise, aerobic exercise can improve working memory function in kids. And it improves it in a way that it, this is not just a little aerobic exercise. They require at least 40 minutes of aerobic exercise a day in order to show these improvements in working memory. And working memory, as you know as a teacher, is really important to keep kids on task, help them to understand and make decisions about the, the tasks that they're engaging in. So I think these kinds of findings are very exciting. Now, sports has not been... Uh, well researched, but it looks as though if this aerobic activity works, aerobic exercise, that there is good possibilities that in organized sports to a certain degree can even work possibly better for some of these children. Something that I found very interesting is the summary on martial arts, mindfulness practices, things like yoga and the classroom. And it turns out again that martial arts, things like Taekwondo, can really improve executive function in kids. It helps develop the prefrontal cortex. Part of that whole experience is not just the physical moves and the training, but it is thinking about who I am, where I am, where am I going, and how do I get there? They are constantly reminding children who are taking these programs that these are the questions they have to bear in mind while they're going through the process of learning Taekwondo. In an interesting example, children are either given Taekwondo training or martial arts, the, the sort of modern martial arts training. And this was done in kids who had problems in adolescence. The kids who were given Taekwondo training actually resolved their problems and had less externalizing behaviors and did better in school. Children who were given the modern martial arts were more aggressive and did worse. So, they didn't have that mindful, mindfulness component in the modern martial arts, and that seems to be key in mediating prefrontal cortex development and getting those executive functions on board. Classroom curricula, it turns out, can also make a difference in prefrontal cortex function. And I've just included an example here of something that is akin to the Wisconsin card sorting task that has been around for many years and helps, uh, helps determine executive function in the prefrontal cortex in adults. And this has been designed to work with children. And in this case, the child is asked to sort cards that either have blue figures or red figures on them according to color. And the, blue, uh, the figures are either rabbits or boats. And so there's categorization in two dimensions. There's the color dimension and what the item is. And by having them switch their strategies, you can actually develop executive function in the prefrontal cortex because they have to now know to inhibit their response to sorting in color and switch it now to sorting by shape. And that, that 
tends to work out very well. But if you're looking for help with uh, behavioral uh, self-control, this kind of thing doesn't really generalize too well. So it really works well for the thing that you're training on, but it doesn't generalize so well to other functions of the prefrontal cortex. So I've just included a few programs that, um, that I've come across that do are designed to enhance executive function and tools of the mind many of you have probably heard of and it's based on the Vygotsky kind of reasoning that you really have to work with uh, getting children to understand expectations, understand self-control and things like that and it actually has been shown now that it does develop executive function in these kids. Montessori practices seem also to develop executive function and something called PATHS which is promoting alternative thinking strategies seems to develop these um, executive functions. Another program, the Chicago School Readiness Program, is, an, is another program that has been shown can develop these functions. If you look at all of these programs and try to find common themes, what they have in common is they don't expect little kids to sit for too long because that is really asking the impossible of young children. But a key thing in what the strategy is here is they reduce stress in the classroom. They really allow the child to feel comfortable enough that they can focus now on cultivating joy about the experiences that they're having, pride in what they've done, and also social bonding and self-confidence. And these are key things that will actually help continue to develop those executive functions and make kids successful throughout their lives. So a summary of the findings of these studies. Children with the poorest executive functions stand to gain the most. So if you have highly reactive kids coming into a grade one classroom and they're not getting the right one-to-one -one relationship interaction with the teacher, teacher closeness, they can be set on a stage for failure later on in life. And these very same kids, if given that closeness, that teacher uh, relationship, can do the best. So you really have the child who's coming in with a reactive temperament who is either going to flourish or fail as a result of those very early years in schooling. <clears throat> you really have to put children in a demanding situation in order to see the differences in their executive function. If you have a chaotic classroom, kids who have better executive function are going to learn more because they, they can focus in on what it is that they're supposed to be doing and manage to get through the task without being interrupted or distracted by others' activities. So you really see larger differences in those most demanding executive function measures. And if you don't challenge executive function, they don't continue to improve. So if you have achieved a level of self-control, in self-inhibition, if you don't continue to challenge children to extend that, that time be before they're going to engage in some activity. And uh, one of the tests they use sometimes is an, a very appealing candy like a Rolo, and they place it in front of children and say, don't eat it yet, I'll tell you when it's time. And some kids can't, uh, can't inhibit themselves from eating it. I'm not sure if I could either if it was a Rolo. But, um, but uh, other children will learn that if they wait, the reward is a higher stakes kind of reward. And so it's worthwhile for them to hold off on, on satisfying that urge. The executive functions do transfer to a certain degree, but the transfer is generally narrow. And from what I've read, it looks like some of the best transfer is through exercise. So now we're gonna step back again and talk a little bit about brain plasticity. So now you've heard that uh, early life is very important in setting the stage for later learning. And how does this happen? It turns out that our experiences are actually changing the physical nature of our brain. And when we have brain changes, we can see behavioral changes. If you change behavior, you initiate changes in the brain. And both of these things are modulated by our environment, just like those early classrooms. Not all brain plasticity is positive, and if you think about habits, you can understand that some brain plasticity can actually be quite negative. But think back to the stress example. Sometimes kids have early experiences that set them up for being highly reactive, highly stressed under certain situations, and that can be detrimental if they're not given the right kind of environment in which to grow. 
So I'm just uh, hearkening you back to the nature-nurture debate, which is no longer a debate. Environment clearly does leave its mark on our genome, and it can modulate future gene expression in sometimes heritable fashion. So you may not just be doing something for the children in your classroom, you may be doing something for their children by giving them the right kinds of positive experiences. I've just read studies because I'm interested in this paternal component, preconception component, and how much that influences brain development, that in some cases a single intense acute exposure to something like alcohol, preconception, can set the stage for changes in the way the brain is going to develop and how that child could ultimately turn out. Just a single event. <laughs> So the study of how environment leaves its footprint on the genome is what we call epigenetics, and it's something that Brian and I have been studying in intense detail in the past few years. So again, an epigenetic change is a change in gene expression that's often mediated by environmental influences. What's interesting about this is it remains stable between cell divisions. So that means as the cell divides, that epigenetic information is retained. And that is how you can pass this information on to future generations. There's clearly ev good evidence now that shows that people who live through the Dutch famine have an altered genome, and that has been transferred through their children and their grandchildren and has changed the metabolic processes in their grandchildren, and these children have more health problems as a result of what their grandparents experienced. And it gives us cause for consideration about how important positive experiences are in our young environment and trying to make sure that children have access to as many of those positive kinds of experiences as they possibly can. So I just wanted to illustrate how this epigenetic code is maintained on the DNA. This is a strand of DNA. And you can see there are these little me groups on it. Those are uh, methyl groups, which is a chemical substitution. And the methyl groups will actually help decide whether or not a gene is expressed or not. So if there is a methyl group on the DNA, it can prevent a gene being expressed, a protein being made, which will change the nature of the person who is carrying these methylation changes on their genome. Okay, so uh, just a review of that. There is. Uh, an enzyme called RNA polymerase that reads our DNA and as a result of having access to that information can make protein. If there is a methyl group at the promoter site, it can't access the DNA and as a result of that, it cannot read that gene. So when you have hypermethylation of the genome, there is no access to information for proteins to be made in your body. And the work that Brian talked about earlier, the prenatal stress, clearly hypermethylates our genome. So we're not having access to making the same kinds of proteins as kids who have not had that adverse early experience. I also want to point out about relationships, that there are quite fundamentally different relationships that we develop with our parenting. And if you think about this, males and females, even in the early childhood education domain, do react to children differently. So I'm talking about moms and dads, but this could be related to grandparents, uncles, and also early child care providers and early child educators. So we'll, we'll examine some of the differences. Play styles. is quite different between men and women. Men do more of the rough and tumble play, chase the kids around the house, uh, throw them around, wrestle with them in the living room, than do mothers. I mean, it's really quite obvious that there's a huge sex difference here. They allow the children to access their body more, explore their body more. They'll climb on dads, they'll be on their shoulders, they'll, dads will give them rides on, on their back, and mothers tend not to do that so much, although there is definitely overlap in these, these styles. And the play is unpredictable, and this is what little kids love about playing with their dads or uncles or grandpas or our early childhood male care providers because they don't know what's coming next. They can't figure it out. Women, unfortunately, are highly predictable in their play. Um, men actually, fathers, when they're playing with their kids, are actually there for their kids. Forty percent of the time that they spend with their kids is in interactive play. Now let's just look at the mother end of things. Women like to color at the table, draw, read to their children. They don't permit too much physical contact and there is some thought that that might be because the baby has uh, access to your body for the first nine months of life and after that you feel like that's enough. <laughs> and. Uh, they certainly do play in a predictable fashion. They only spend about 22% of the time that they're spending with their kids in interactive play. 
So just examples of the kinds of things that men or fathers do, tag, wrestling, lots of physical contact, mothers, coloring, drawing, board games are nice, especially if you can get your children to clean them up after, and then little contact. Discipline styles also vary between men and women, and part of the reason that these things do vary is because we have differing sex hormones, and they change our brain in different ways, and so our solution to problems are different, men versus women. So men tend to use a quick disciplinary kind of style in trying to get whatever was, was, had gone wrong, get it over with quick, and let's move forward. Women will always try to soften the blow. They'll want to encourage their children to think about it. It takes, a, it's, there's quite a long expanse of time that is required for women to help their children resolve problems. That's, that doesn't seem to happen with men. They want immediate results and they want to move on. Uh, as far as encouragement styles, and I've gone back to dads and moms as the heading here because you can see at the picture of the father encouraging his child to explore this peak. If that wasn't the father, I think there'd be big issues with the family if they saw what uh, early care providers might be doing with their children on a field trip. So they do encourage their kids to take risks. They tend not to coddle, and they want the child to stretch their limits. Cheerleader style of encouragement. Moms encourage kids to be safe. They want to be sure that the child is secure and comfortable at the level of uh, the activity that they're engaging in. And it, we call that sort of more a lifeguard style of encouragement. But clearly, both of these styles are important to fully develop the prefrontal cortex in a child. If it's only exposed to one of the forms of all of these things, they tend to have a very narrow perspective on how to deal with life. If they have access to both views, they actually have a better and more well-rounded perspective on how to deal with life. Now I want to take you to a lab study, and this is a lab study with daigus, and aren't they so cute? They are tiny, well they're rodents that grow to be about the size of a, a small guinea pig, and what's interesting about this type of rodent is they have biparental care of their young. So both mothers and fathers participate in raising the the babies in this type of a rodent family. In most rodent families, the mother is responsible for early nurturing and childcare, so to speak. So. I want to talk about a father attachment, but first I want to draw your attention to the bottom panel of this slide, <clears throat> because this is the uh, dagoos again, and this is in their frontal cortex. If you take father out of the situation, and you have a single mother raising the children, note that the, the, dendrite, the dendrite is bearing less of the little bumps or dendritic spines with father gone than with father there. So having that father experience is enriching frontal cortex development, enriching the connections, and enriching the child. And let's now slip back to uh, humans. It turns out that if you look at vocabulary, it's father vocabulary, not mother, that predicts kids' literacy skills. Even though dad speaks fewer words to their children, it's their vocabulary that's a better predictor of how well kids will do with literacy than mothers. If father is strongly attached, they have stronger inter the kids will have stronger interpersonal relationship skills. There tend to be, as children grow up in the adolescent years, fewer teen pregnancies, less drug use, less likely to join gangs, more likely to finish high school if there's strong father attachment. And strong mother attachment predicts none of these things. And I know as a mother, I felt kind of devastated when I read this paper, thinking that, are you kidding me? Is their dad that's really going to make a difference as far as a lot of these behavioral indicators go? <clears throat> but that's what the research shows. So back to the issue of, of uh, prefrontal plasticity, the question we can ask here is why have what you've just heard, why is it important? And one of the reasons is that social hierarchies that we fall into as adults predict our health. So the social, your, your position in the social hierarchy, your socioeconomic status is going to predict your physical and mental health in your mid-50s. But it turns out it's also true in kindergarten. You can actually see work by uh, Tom Boyce at the University of British Columbia has shown that if you look at children playing, that they, when they're playing in classrooms, and he was looking in kindergartens, they actually establish hierarchies. They are children who are involved, and they are children who are not involved. And if you follow these children, what you can find is the children who are not involved, the children who are not playing and are at the bottom of the hierarchies, uh, do less well. They don't really flourish very well. Well, can we? figure out why that might be. Is there something in the animal studies we can, we can do? And so we know our colleague Sergio Pellis, who normally is on our dog and pony show but couldn't be here today because he had to be in South Carolina. 
a little warmer looking at monkeys. Um, all mammals have play behavior and there are rules. And so these are two rats playing. If you're a rat, there are rules. If you're a cat, there are rules. If you're a rat, one rule is my job is to try and nuzzle the nape of your neck. That's what I'm going to try to do. That's what kittens do too. And the other rat's going to say, no, you don't. My job is to prevent it. And so what you get is this sort of uh, uh, rolling around as one tries to get to the back of the other. This is not play fighting. If you're fighting with a rat, the last thing you want to do is to have your mouth anywhere near their mouth. What you want to do is have your mouth near their butt because there's no teeth there. So that's a totally different kind of behavior. But there's other rules. I get to do it, then you get to do it. If, you don't, if they don't trade back and forth, um, then there's problems. And there's a variety of other rules. The key question we're going to ask here is, what is all this play behavior doing to the brain? Is it is important for brain development? And it turns out it is. The amount of play that the rats engage in affects the complexity of cells in the prefrontal cortex. So the, we can manipulate the amount of play by ha giving in various numbers of play partners, like zero versus four or 10 or whatever. And so the more play partners there are, the more play there is. Now, why is this important? Well, these cells are being changed, these neural networks are being changed by this play behavior, but not only that, if we look at animals who during the juvenile years got lots of play or not very much play, and we look at them as adults, it turns out that the individuals who had more play have a more flexible brain. That is, the brain is more likely to respond to experiences. Animals that had no play, that they lived only with adults, and adult rats won't play with infant rats or uh, juvenile rats, um, they, they, they'll interact with them, but they won't play. Um, those animals are really unresponsive to things in their environment when they're later uh, uh, examined. This was a real surprise to us, and, it, and it's led us to now go back and say exactly what's going on. How are the methylation changes uh, uh, leading to this? Okay, so to conclude, brain development is prolonged. It's especially in the prefrontal cortex and executive function domain. It's profoundly affected by experience and the, the um, breadth of those experiences we've only touched on. There's lots of other experiences. Virtually any experience you have is going to affect prefrontal development. This interaction of nature and nurture, and I, I want to give a, an example here from uh, Don Hebb. He was once asked, what's more important, nature or nurture? And his response was, what's more important to the area of a rectangle, the width or the, or the length? You can't, there isn't any answer to that. So this nature-nurture interaction predicts success in school, it's success uh, in lifetime and, and health uh, throughout the rest of your life. And we'll stop there. <laughs>